Hello, welcome to Engineering with Rosie Live. And sorry about the little technical hiccup at the start, but that's pretty much um, par for the course for me with these things. Um, so yeah, welcome to all the viewers and please uh, comment, uh, write in the comments where you're calling in from and what your interest is in energy storage and the, um, and the grid. And I'd like to introduce a special guest that we have here today. This is Warwick Foster. Um, he's an electricity grid expert who's spent over 20 years working with electricity markets. And he has experience with all kinds of different um, battery technologies, including lithium ion and also um, some flow battery experience recently. Um, uh, when I look through his employment history, he's been working for a long time as an energy trader, then a technical manager for energy storage, then working with Flow Batteries, and now he's technical director of a future energy team building capabilities in energy markets. So thanks a lot for joining, um, Warwick, and thanks for bringing much, this expertise. Rosie. Yeah. So is there anything else that you would like to add about your, um, your experience that I've missed out? Oh, no, I think that's a, a good short um, summary. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so uh, this live stream is sponsored by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. They make strike tape, a retrofitable lightning protection system for things that go fast, like wind turbine blades and aircraft. Um, and I also need to give a big thanks to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon community for their support. And also they submitted some really good questions um, ahead of this live stream that I'm going to be, um, be reading out. Okay, so just check in the comments where we've got people calling in from um, from Western Arizona. Um, Daniel Daniel Nindov, <laughs> modern looking guy, uh, interested in RV mount. Um, we've got Peter Ross from the Hunter Valley, interested in fixing the grid. That's a very interesting interesting area. Lots of cool energy projects going on there. Um, we've got Piper Trip with some bagpipes from Denver, Colorado, interested in what the mix of battery technologies might look like as we try to remove fossil generation on the grid. Okay, and, and lots more from, uh, yeah, the US and Europe and Australia. So that's a nice, a nice mix um, around the world. Okay, so I just wanted to start off with um, uh, some um, comments from the YouTube poll that I did. I posted uh, on YouTube and on LinkedIn um, asking, what do you think about batteries role in the electricity grid to complement um, wind and solar? I mostly mean, yeah, just variable renewables because other renewables like, um, like hydro are pretty easy to incorporate. So on YouTube, we mostly saw people saying the real problem is long duration and seasonal storage. I definitely agree that's a big, a big challenge and I'm thinking yeah. I might actually separate that out for another another topic i don't know if you have something to say quickly about that work oh, look i think that's obviously a, a, a challenge i mean um at the moment the energy market um, you know it, um, i guess it's not um the way the energy market works at the moment with the sort of high spot prices um certainly encourages um short um duration batteries uh, you know, um I think that obviously with AEMO in Australia, the Australian energy market operator and others have identified that in time with the growing um, influx of uh, renewable generation and particularly the seasonality that will um, that happens with uh, you know times of low wind that might persist for a number of days or weeks um, means that we need something, uh, additional storage of more than just a couple of hours. Um, mm. And at the moment, there's not really... Um, the way, as I said, the, the, the spot market's very short term. It doesn't really give a market signal um, for that to be built. Um, yeah. So it's a, an issue that, you know, the, obviously the market operator has rightly identified. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting and a huge, huge topic, I think. Um, so the LinkedIn polls are actually super annoying because you can only use the 30 characters in your response. So I had to kind of truncate. But there was a bit of a, a, a difference in what, um, yeah, the results between the YouTube audience and the LinkedIn audience that I thought was interesting because on LinkedIn, most of my connections are, you know, probably more knowledgeable about this sort of thing than me. Oh. And I was interested to see that um, people were saying tech breakthroughs are needed. But then in the comments, nearly everybody was saying, well, it's not that I think that batteries need to get better. It's that we need technologies to be able to use the batteries better. Um, so I don't know if you have a comment about that work. 
uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. So, like, um, I guess um, anyway, in terms of batteries that are uh, being used better, um, um, I guess there's maybe perhaps those respondents are talking about the opportunity for sort of the Internet of Things and, and I guess, a more smart enablement of devices. Um, I think, you know, the main thing with um, a lot of, um, say, chemical um, energy storage is bringing the cost down. Um, obviously, lithium's come down significantly. Um, but, you know, other technologies, particularly flow batteries that um, haven't yet been produced at, at volume, um, need to have volume to be, you know, cost competitive. Um, so, like, you know, my previous experience uh, was uh, with Redflow, a zinc bromine um, battery or flow battery. Um, and the, the issue with that was about trying to get, you know, significant volumes. And that would be the same for vanadium and others that um, uh, to produce it volume uh, to get the cost down. And, and the thing is that with, well, I guess with my experience with zinc is that uh, with Redflow, that zinc is a lot cheaper than vanadium. Vanadium is inherently expensive. Um, and zinc is an abundant material. Um, so it's really not so much a question about trying to get the technology right, but uh, more about producing in volume and uh, the manufacturing processes, removing a lot of the sort of manual element from it that will affect red flow, for example, at this point in time. Um, so effectively, the, the components of a, of a red flow battery, the HDPE tank, the um, uh, the zinc used in it, um, other plastics uh, and components um, do lend themselves to mass manufacture. So if red Redflow, for example, is able to get the volume up and the price down, um, the other way for, um, I guess, other batteries or flow batteries to compete effectively with um, lithium ion is the possibility to extend their life significantly. Uh, so obviously with lithium ion batteries, uh, conventional NMC, um, they tend to, um, they degrade over time. So maybe after 10 years or so that they're not, they can't really be used anymore or certainly less effective than they were. Mm. Whilst with flow batteries, you can sort of extend that life to perhaps instead of having a 10 year lifetime, having a 20 or 25 year lifetime. Uh, and one of the key things about storage is it's the capital cost um, divided by the throughput. So if you're able to, if the battery is initially more expensive, for example, as flow batteries tend to be, if you put more kilowatt hours through it by extending the life, you bring the effective cost down. Yeah. Okay. And I think we'll get we'll get into all those details a bit later. Um, I just want to give an outline of the show. So first, we're going to talk about um, like what kinds of batteries for what purpose. Um, then how does the electricity market work, which is oh. something that I find really interesting. And I kind of like a few years ago when I was working in the wind industry, you know, just really focused on bringing the cost of um, renewable energy down. It kind of gradually occurred to me um, that the energy market is kind of a, a, a complicated thing and varies around the world. And it's not, you know, it's not just a matter of getting cheap electricity. You have to get everything everything working at the right time in the right place. So um, I'll be interested to get some details about that. Um, sure. we'll talk a bit about some new battery technologies and then, and yeah, like the pros and cons, how they, um, you know, what makes them each suit so different, different applications. And then if we get time, then we'll talk about hydrogen and its potential to use as energy storage, other long duration and seasonal storage options and distributed versus centralized storage options. Sure. So I just want to start with what kind of batteries for what purpose. And I've got some um, some charts <laughs> that that show um, how, you know, different kinds of batteries and energy storage fit in together. Um, this one is about energy density of battery um, chemistries, which is probably not so relevant for grid storage. But then... Um, so it's loading. Then there's a lot of charts like this, and uh, you see a lot of different iterations of this chart where they show the, show the storage capacity along the x-axis and the release time along the y-axis. So um, in the bottom left, then we have really um, kind of small, short duration um, storage that's going to, you know, um, respond quickly. And then up in the top right, then you've got stuff that can give a lot of energy over a long duration of time. So 
Warwick, can you explain a little bit about, about these kind of charts and how the different technologies fit together uh, and the different roles that they're playing? Sure. Uh, I'm not sure where this chart is from, but I, I might suggest to your readers, um, readers sorry, your viewers, that um, batteryuniversity.com is a, a very good free resource. I'm not sure if you've seen that as well, Rosie. Okay. But I can try and bring it up while you're talking. <laughs> sure. I guess in terms of like... Um, uh, most of my experience has been on what we call the stationary energy market. So that's basically grid, community, household batteries. Um, uh, alluding to the chart that was just shown previously, most um, we have high power batteries and they tend to be for applications such as maintaining frequency. They have limited amount of energy, so they put out high power for a short period of time. Um, and they've been some of the initial batteries, so they might be expected to, if they're running at full power, may run up to 30 minutes or an hour. Um, then you tend to have the more, I guess, um, it's pretty common in the grid of say one to two hours of storage um, so that uh, they will run, the, the, the normally the charge and discharge rates, the maximum rates are the same. So it might take two hours to charge and two hours to discharge, for example. Uh, many of Tesla's um, grid scale batteries are, are two hours in duration, for example. Um, and then after that, we have, I guess, the two to four hours or more. And uh, that tends to be um, flow batteries that are more concerned about shifting um, large amounts of energy. So they tend to, I guess, um, it's almost like comparing a sports car, I guess, or a race car, a Formula One car that you know, responds very quickly for a short period of time, whilst you know, it's more like a diesel truck at the other end that you're shifting large amounts of energy over a longer period of time. And that's sort of suited uh, quite well to uh, say solar uh, you know if you're looking at conventionally solar whilst it's um you know it might generate from early in the morning till dusk there's probably only about four or five hours where there's a significant amount of excess energy to store so a four-hour solution say for an off-grid might be a, a good fit and then beyond that beyond eight hours i guess it's sort of uh then you're looking at pumped hydro um, and other technologies so it tends to be quite expensive to have batteries to store um, more than eight hours, mainly because the capital cost of batteries is particularly high and you really need to, to make them work effectively uh, economically. You really want to charge and discharge them probably at least every day. Some batteries, for example, those high power ones can be cycled um, you know, many times in a day. Uh, and one of the key things about particularly about lithium batteries is that... Um, to a certain extent, well, I'll take a step back. There's a thing called the C rating, which is basically uh, it's one over the time. So if it's a if it's a two hour battery, uh, so that's one divided by two hours, it's 0.5 C. Uh, one over one, that's a, a one C battery. So the higher the C rating, the higher the power, and the less that the energy is um, duration for a particular battery. But you can find for a given chemistry that um, to a large extent, those relationships are managed by the, the battery management system. So, um, you know, you're not limited. Well, sorry, at the end of the day, you're limited to a, a particular real level of how much power you could put out of a battery. But there's a compromise between if you cycle a battery very hard for a short duration, it, it tends to shorten its life. So the BMS, the battery management system, will be, uh, able to manage that to, to get the best life out of the battery. Uh, so it's a compromise between running it hard um, versus maximising its life. Okay. Um, all right, I wanted to bring up the um, Lazard's levelized cost of storage. Um, and I, I mean, I assume, Warwick, that you've seen this before and maybe you have an opinion about how well it suits or, or doesn't suit. But this is what I see people using, um, you know, to compare battery storage. But I mean, it's based on some pretty specific assumptions about how you'll use your battery. Um, my understanding is that it's based around economics of charging and discharging once per day, which is kind yes. of quite a specific use case. So what do you think about this chart and how how well it allows you to, you know, um, to compare wow. different battery technologies? Is it is it useful? Is it a good starting point or is it just not really relevant? Uh, well, no, I think Lazard's a very good place to start. And some of the work done by 
um, Bloomberg and others as well, or Bloomberg New Energy Finance. I mean, the, the, the question is, it depends upon what the C rating is too, uh, because yeah, often, yeah. say, I think with Bloomberg, they would normally do it's a two hour and a half C battery. Um, but when you look at the higher C ratings, they're more expensive per cost, uh, per unit of, me- of, of energy per megawatt hour. Um, but you can get away with a smaller battery. So it's a very good place to start, but it's, um, you know, it, you have to look at the specific use case of, you know, if you need a one hour battery and you're looking at two hour prices, it's going to give a, a more optimistic view of the pricing than, than what reality will be. But this is a very good place to start. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So the next question I wanted to ask is um, one that I have always uh, had in my mind. It's like, we have, uh, I'll go back to one of those charts with the, the storage duration, not that one, this one's better. And, you know, you've got lithium ion batteries here, you know, saying that I can go um, around an hour or maybe four hours or something. But I know if I like charge my mobile phone, it's got a lithium ion battery in it. If I turn it off, then a week later, it's still going to have like really pretty close to 100% charge. So why can't we just use lithium-ion batteries for, for everything? I mean, people say, oh, there's a limit of four hours on a lithium-ion battery, but, I mean, experience with <laughs> mobile phones and laptops tells us that's not true. So what's that limit really about? Uh, well, I guess the key thing is it's, uh, it's about, um, it's like having a car in a way that um, um, over time it, it wears out and i I'm, I would imagine a few people might contrast your story with, um, yes, I've got my, you know, three-year-old iPhone and the flat battery only charges for an hour and I have to keep recharging it because the, the capacity degrades significantly um, for lithium batteries. So it does depend on the technology, the particular chemistry, but like it would not be uh, atypical for a, uh, if you start with a, say, a, a grid-scale battery to have a, if it was 100, you know, megawatt hours or 100, Kilowatt hours of storage. That it, in reality, by the time it gets to um, you know, say ten years of daily use, it's only warranted to sixty kilowatt hours. So the problem is that like, you get a smaller and smaller resource. Well, normally, um, the power stays the same, but the energy shrinks. So like if you had, I don't know, let's say it was a hundred kilowatt hour battery and it had um, fifty kilowatts of power, you would still be able to get fifty kilowatt. Um, after 10 years, but it's only going to last, you know, two thirds of the time. And there mm-hmm. are other considerations around losses as well that, um, you know, no battery is um, uh, lossless. And it's, you know, um, I guess a uh, good lithium would probably be 90% efficient in terms of round trip efficiency. But there are lots of losses when you start, you know, you charge from solar. Um, and by the time you, you've got to convert the DC in your solar. Uh, to AC in the home, then back to DC in the battery. And then when you want to use it, it goes from DC back to AC in the home. There, there's um, you know, not insignificant losses in that. So, yeah, it's um, the main thing is that the capacity does degrade. Um, for larger scale systems, you can replace the batteries. Uh, you know, if you've got a whole, if so, like a commercial grid scale, um, you know, that was one of the advantages of um, flow batteries, of course, by comparison, is that... Um, they do last, um, you know, they don't lose capacity if they're properly maintained. Um, you know, you had 100 kilowatt hours at the start. Uh, Ten years later, you also expect to have 100 kilowatt hours. Um, you know, the, 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 the challenge they have is that they're less efficient on their round trip. That's uh, one of the uh, issues, and they tend to be three to four hours in duration. So, you know, it's around about um, 0.3 C. Um, so it's more focused okay. on energy, not power. All right. So then there's a related question here from Christopher. Sylvia, um, are there fundamental limits to how long batteries can discharge for both solid and flow? How long could a flow battery discharge for? In theory, could you make a flow battery arbitrarily large? And then actually a second part to that question, for flow batteries, how much does the electrolyte itself cost versus the rest of the system? Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll answer, answer the first one. So like... Um, uh, for a flow battery, uh, and look, I'm, I'm not the chemical engineer, but um, obviously I can relate to some of my experience at Redflow, which will be relevant to, to other flow technologies. Um, mm-hmm. um, 
Um, one of the, 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 the power I understand is mainly limited by the uh, surface area of the, uh, the, the plates that you have. So, um, you know, you could have more, um, or you increase the surface area, you could increase the, the power out of the battery. Uh, in the case of red flow, so it's like a sealed system. So there's you know, a given 100 kilos or so of electrolyte um, and that and you can't change that like you. In theory, um, you could uh, make the tank bigger, but you'd have to redesign the battery for that. So um, in, in theory, um, I guess you could make a, a massively large tank um, and have many, many hours of storage for a flow battery. Um, but then there's a whole lot of other design issues that come into play about like pumping liquids that um, how you'd manage that. Um, so it's, um, you know, and you've got the counter for there's various, um, well, there's losses due to pumps having to run. So one thing is that you, there's, um, you can run quite low, but then the, the problem you have is that like when the pumps are um, running and, and you're at full power, uh, the parasitic load is, is minimal, but if you run at a very slow rate, then the um, the pumps and, and other losses become more significant. There's a whole lot of other more technical areas around shunt currents and, and various things that, that impact on the battery as well. But like uh, my experience with Red Flow was that, yes, it would be run from a few hundred watts up to about five kilowatts for a 10 kilowatt hour battery. but uh, for best efficiency in the red flow case, it was around uh, you know, three kilowatts or so uh, was ideal. Okay. It's, and, well, there's and, just so, so much going on. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's, a kind of, well it's, a, it's a machine. I mean, obviously, um, maybe my interview red flow, they'll give you some more technical details if our, our viewers are interested. But, yeah, there's a, it's a complex beast. And, and even with lithium ion as well, there's a lot of considerations that, you know, down electrochemical level that need to be taken into account. Um, yeah. um, so the second question was around the cost of the electrolyte. Um, yeah, I think just basically, you know, like, um, so the way I've had a flow battery explained to me was that it's expensive to, you know, the power aspect of it is expensive. You know, if you want one megawatt versus five megawatts, that's a big difference. But to get more megawatt hours, it's just a matter of building a bigger tank and that's really cheap. Um, is that true? Because I mean, some of no, them have pretty in, expensive in theory, but not in chemicals practice. in them. Yeah. In, in theory, but not in practice, because I mean, mm. it, uh, if you can imagine, like, well, say we're talking about, uh, you know, the red flow battery, which was 10 kilowatt hours delivering three kilowatts. I mean, if you want 100 kilowatt hours, I mean, uh, I don't know how the. How, how you'd pump all the electrolyte on a 10 times larger tank, it probably brings into a whole lot of other design considerations of like. You have mm. to start mixing the electrolyte to make sure that it's, uh, you know, um, homogenous. I, I, I'm not really sure, but like, there's a lot of engineering questions that uh, it's, it sounds simple in principle. And when I first started, that was my expectation. But like mm -hmm. the details of it make it uh, much more difficult than that. Yes. I mean, the other thing too is with a flow battery is that sort of you can um, you, you can actually put it offline effectively and um, store it. Um, like, you know, this you need to speak to a chemical engineer, but like if you had a, a lithium ion battery, for example, and you turned it off for like a month, um, you start to lose energy over a period of time and you can potentially have impacts on the capacity of the battery. So like a lithium ion battery, you can't sort of like a Jurassic Park scenario, like turn everything off and then come back five years later and then expect everything to come on. Um, mm. you know, the lithium mine batteries need to be turned on and managed. So it, it will depend upon you know, what the chemistry is for each. Um, so, you know, um, but you wouldn't normally see that like when you're using a mobile phone because you're using it quite frequently. Yeah. Okay, let's move on now to talk about how the electricity market works. And I mean, obviously, you're an Australian electricity market expert, and I, I have gradually been learning over the last few years that it's totally different in a lot of other places. But as far as you're able to comment on other um, markets as well, please do, because I know people are, yeah, all spread around. I've just I've got a little fact sheet from um, the well, AMEC, what's that, the Australian? Yes. Okay. So look, um, um, I have to be brief on this one because there's a lot to talk about potentially. Yeah. But essentially, 
you know, the Australian, um, the NEM, the National Electricity Market, which is uh, about 200 terawatts hours per annum. Uh, that's effectively most of Australia other than WA and the Northern Territory, or sorry, Western Australia for those um, overseas. Um, it's not, uh, it's an energy only market. So basically much of the time, and it, maybe if we, you know, I guess, put our minds back a few years before there was much renewable energy in the system, normally spot prices um, reflect the, what's called the short run marginal cost, which is basically you know, the cost of generation, mainly your, your fuel cost. So we, we when the, the market first started, prices sat around, you know, over 20 years ago, it was like $11 a megawatt hour, um, just sort of re essentially representing the, the cost of um, uh, burning coal. Now, the thing is that um, the prices can go quite low and, and very, very high. So as low as minus $1,000 per megawatt hour and up to $15,000 a megawatt hour. Um, now, the thing is that um, I guess the design of this market, as I mentioned, is an energy only market. Um, some other markets have a capacity mechanism plus an energy component. So Western Australia, for example, is one of those um, where the spot price is much lower. Um, but there's a capacity mechanism um, paid to those participants who are able to sort of demonstrate that they have capacity available to help the system meet peak demand. Um, the nature of it is essentially that, um, you know, if you're only, if there are no really high spot prices, then everyone would, all the generators would go out of business. You need high spot prices. People um, perhaps don't always appreciate the, the need for them, but like, um, if there's a risk of $15,000 a megawatt hour, if you're a retailer, that um, you could easily go out of business if you're not uh, having some financial contracts in place to mitigate um, uh, as much of that risk as you can. So um, generators... So what's the... Uh, can you just say... So the highest is 15000 per megawatt hour. What's the average? What's a normal price? Oh, it, maybe, uh, maybe $50, something like that. It, it really, it okay. really so. and, and more recently in the NEM we've seen quite a lot of negative prices as well. Um, I'll, I'll touch on that in a moment, but okay. um, the high prices are required to um, basically justify the investment cost, the capital cost for a generator. So, um, you know, um, one thing that tends to be, um, there's a high capital cost for like say a coal fired plant um, and, you know, um, open cycle gas turbines are, are relatively have low capital costs, but high running costs. Um, so they benefit from high spot prices, for example. So it's meant to do one of two things. Essentially, those high spot prices are enough to sort of help you cover your capital costs, but they're infrequent. So if you're a generator and uh, you, you're not likely to make an investment waiting for a $15,000 or multiple high price spikes to make your investment, you contract. So in the same way that a retailer is motivated to avoid the risk of those high spot prices, you'll find that the um, um, on the other side of the ledger that the um, uh, the generator wants to uh, ensure themselves against too many low prices. So there's a, a meeting in the middle, shall we say, where people contract. Um, you probably don't have time to talk about contracts, but like they would normally do a swap price, a swap contract or a cap contract um, to hedge between those um, counterparties. Yeah, um, I was actually, I wanted to talk a little bit about that because I used to live in Cooma for a couple of years, which is, right. um, yeah, you know, near the snow, near the snow yep. mountains. So a lot of people in town worked for Snowy, Snowy Hydro. Um, and before I met these people, I assumed that Snowy Hydro, you know, big, big hydro scheme, I assumed that they make their money from generating electricity, but I learned that they're effectively an insurance company um, and they're, you know, they're, they're selling insurance contracts for people that don't want the risk of having to pay a $15,000 per megawatt hour price. And Snowy Hydro know that if the prices do go up that high, then they'll be able to generate and make a lot of money from these high wholesale prices. And so they make their money that way. Um, is that, that pretty widespread and maybe how you could imagine batteries um, starting to operate as well? That's one of the attractions for um, the batteries is the, um, I'll give you uh, one example. Um, I did an analysis um, for 2020 and prior years, but um, looking at a battery in New South Wales um, and just looking at um, the opportunity for a battery to, shall we we'll call it arbitrage, essentially just buying low, selling high, and, and if that battery had 
perfect foresight. You know, I that knew every spot price that was going to occur uh, exactly. It probably doesn't matter too much in New South Wales in the sense of prices are somewhat predictable. We would know that, you know, it's a 40 degree day in New South Wales. Um, we would expect at three o'clock the uh, highest um, demand and hence the highest price. But for a battery in New South Wales, um, you would have made half your revenue uh, in just two days. So like, you know, um, those high spot prices are, are quite significant. And, and that's what sort of what a, a battery investment is looking for. They're, they're perfect to take advantage of those high prices. Um, going back to your snowy hydro, yes, I would expect that. Um, so one thing, like a battery, um, you know, um, they've got scarce energy in, in their hydro dams. I mean, a lot more energy than obviously what batteries do many, many times. Um, but they cannot afford to run all the time and they're influenced by the, uh, you know, the annual snowfall and the snow melt um, that flows into the snowy scheme. So they will sell caps because they will receive a premium. Probably a good example is that the standard cap contract is uh, what's called a $300 strike. Um, and that means that if the price goes above $300 a megawatt hour, then Snowy Hydro or whoever else might sell, they would sell cap contracts to maybe a retailer. And you know if the price was $500 in the market, um, they would have to pay out 200. Um, However, the key thing is it's an insurance product, as Rosie rightly said. So, you know, I'll make up a price, but maybe it's $15 per megawatt hour. Um, so every hour of every day, if regardless of whether something or nothing happens, um, the seller of that cap gets $15 a megawatt hour. So if Snowy Hydro, uh, if the price never went above $300, they'd still get their $15 times however many hours or over however many months or quarters that they sold that contract. So they get money okay. for their insurance. All right. I have an interesting comment here from Mario Salazar. It sounds like they are creating artificial demand and using that demand to abuse the consumers. And that's that's something I also hear people say. As um, Somebody also mentioned to me it sounded like Enron. Um, and, yeah, I mean, can you... Can you explain how this isn't a big a big scam on behalf of Snowy Hydro and others um, playing a similar sort of role? Oh uh, well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get into the politics of Snowy Hydro and others, but look, I guess the key thing is that um, there are other sellers of, of caps. Um, I used to work for a business that um, I was uh, Salinta Energy, um, and they had uh, gas-fired peaking stations. Um, uh, they were basically uh, about 90 megawatts in total for two generators in Victoria. Um, mm -hmm. And they're basically aircraft engines that are that, that run on gas and, and they would sell caps at $300 a megawatt hour as well. Um, Snowy, if you're trying to suggest that they put the prices up, I mean, uh, until Snowy 2 Not gets, that they do, but that you, you could imagine somebody abusing it in that way. Uh, well, I don't know. It, the, it's a question of market power and that if they do something wrong and they abuse market power, then they can obviously uh, be penalised for that. Um, certainly in my experience, I have witnessed that um, at times market players have um, uh, done questionable behaviour, um, you know, and it's been in front of the courts and judgments have been made. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, essentially any... Um, in a technical sense, any generator uh, has market power if it's able to manipulate the price. Um, uh, but anyone can do that, for, particularly for a, a very short period of time. Uh, like when I was running this peaking generator, which was 90 megawatts, um, I think we impacted the price for like two five-minute periods in a year. Uh, so really, it's about having you know volume. So obviously, Snowy does have market power. Uh, mm -hmm. Other generators do as well. Um, it has to be sort of, I guess, um, proven that they've abused market power. Uh, and, and I guess the key thing at the moment is that um, uh, in terms of demand, Snowy doesn't have, it does have some um, uh, pumped hydro, but not a lot. Um, and, and that's hence why they're looking at well, building Snowy 2.0. The Snowy 2.0 is not really a generator. It's pumped storage of, you know, shift. it's a big battery, as people like to call it. Um, mm -hmm. 
Okay. And I just really quickly want to relate it to a couple of world events because, you know, we saw last year, last winter in Texas, the Texas freeze where electricity prices spiked high. It sounds like they've got some sort of similar market arrangement. Um, and then the other one is in Europe at the moment where I think I saw 20 or more um, energy retails have gone out of business over the, you know, the high gas prices predominantly. Um how do these situations happen? Don't they have insurance in, in place or, you, you know, like how, how can you see um, situations like that if there are these caps available? Why are so many companies choosing not to get them or, uh, I mean, maybe you don't know. But... No, 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 no. Um, yeah, it's a complex question to answer in a way. Um, so every business will have a risk, well, sorry, every business should have a risk management policy. Um, Many of the, um, uh, having worked in a number of the retailers, um, they will be obliged to purchase a certain level of um, swaps. It's interesting that you mention caps because under the accounting standards, caps are not actually regarded as an effective hedge. It's more, it's in, in a prudent way, yes, they're a very good risk management tool, but uh, in the way that the accountants view them, they're not regarded as an effective hedge. Um, okay. Which sort of, may, uh, so, the swaps are compulsory, the caps are optional. I guess you might review it um, in that way. Um, so at times you might not be able to find the contracts that you're after. Um, um, you have to do the best with what, um, it depends upon what business you are. So like if you're a large retailer, like you know the gen tailors, they'll have a portfolio of generation, they will buy and sell contracts. You know They would not expect their generation portfolio to anywhere near match perfectly their their own retail portfolio. So if they, they've got too much generation, they'll sell contracts into the market to other players and, and vice versa. Um, we have seen companies go bust here in Australia as well. Um, you know, some of those small retailers, Jack Green, uh, what was the other one? I thought I'm, is it Go Energy? Or, um, mm. And they basically had the same problem that um, they're exposed to the spot market. Um, AEMO has sort of financial requirements that you need to have money but available every single day um, through either bank guarantees or reallocations to guarantee that you're not, um, well, uh, sorry, that you're able to make those payments to the market or otherwise um, then the whole market would fail. So, mm. um, and what will happen in that case is another retailer, like a retailer of last resort will basically get hand past those customers um, to another retailer. So, um, you know, many of those smaller retailers, for example, are not able to, um, they're not big enough to, to buy the caps um, and, and swaps. They might not have the financial strength to uh, participate in buying ASX futures, for example, and other counterparties are not interested in trading with them. So um, I think that's a bit of a motivation. You might see in Australia, there's a lot of customers that are, you know, they'll, they'll go through, they'll get the spot price, they'll pay a monthly fee um, that sort of washes the risk of the electricity market back onto the consumer. Um, mm. But, you know, it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, at some point in the future we'll see some high prices again and, you know, um, some businesses will go out of business uh, here in Australia too. Um, okay. But, you know, I think it's well managed in Australia. Yeah, but you can definitely see how it can go go wrong and especially like at the moment everything's changing so much. I guess there, yeah, it's a big big risk if your whole, you know, you get a, a failure in the electricity grid because of the, the market wasn't set up right. So, um, yeah, it's, yeah. Okay, I want to move on now to the, the battery stuff and the technology um, aspects because yeah. I know that's what people are mostly interested in. Um, so I have this... Um, this chart I got from, oh, where is it? Yeah, um, EIA uh, about different use cases for for batteries. So this is a US um, showing um, the you know this this left hand bar in each section is 2016, and then the right hand one is 2020. So you can kind of see see the trends. Um, and so I don't know, maybe you can talk a bit about some of these use cases. And the one that I'm kind of interested in is these b really big rises in um, arbitrage and yeah, low, load falling, ramping or spinning reserves. So could you maybe talk through a, a little bit about some of these use cases for batteries and why are we seeing this, you know, massive increases in certain, like in the way that we, we're really seeing big changes in the way we use batteries now in the grid, right? 
Sure. So um, I'll talk in the Australian context, obviously. Yeah. Um, so in Australia, uh, with frequency regulation, we've got um, frequency control ancillary services. Um, that market has grown very significantly. Back in the past, it was actually sort of a, a tendered service that certain um, generators would tender to the market operator to provide them. But in the last, I think, um, 15 years or so, it's been a, uh, a market-based um, system. So uh, generators have to bid to be on for that. Um, it's probably grown um, from 10 to 200 to around 400 million, uh, I think, most recently in Australian context, um, uh, which is like, it sounds like a lot, and it is, but, you know, it's only small against um, the energy market, which is... Um, in many billions of dollars by comparison. Um, so the frequency regulation, those services, um, they're ones to basically keep, well, in the context of Australia, um, to keep the system within 50 hertz uh, within a tight band. So generators um, and loads can be paid to respond quickly. And the thing about batteries as compared to, um, uh, I guess, more conventional technologies is the fast response time so that if a large generator or a large load trips, um, you need to be able to respond to either you know, uh, inject or withdraw uh, energy from the market to bring the system into balance. So there's various markets of delayed services to try and uh, damp that uh, disturbance. Um, we don't really have a sort of, I guess, a spinning reserve market, but I guess I'll talk to arbitrage is probably the, the one that's of, of much interest. Arbitrage is best. Look, I guess at the end of the day, you could probably put everything into the category of arbitrage, really, uh, because it's a case of buying low, selling high, um, for and you know all of that. You know, you're, you're buying the energy from the energy market, and you're well. For example, in, in the frequency regulation, it doesn't actually use a lot of. Um, and this is one of the other reasons why, um, I guess, the high power batteries traditionally have been um, uh, focused is that probably of the nominal power rating. So if you had injected 10 megawatts for an hour, you're not actually going to use 10 megawatt hours of energy. You probably only use about 10% of that. Um, so you, you don't need, uh, you only need minutes of storage. Um, hence, that's why people have been doing that. But anyway, back to arbitrage in the conventional sense is probably what we look at buying low and selling high in the spot price. Um, so um, this is, you know, the volume and energy we're talking a market you know of um, tens of uh, gigawatts you know probably between 30 to 50 gigawatts across the NEM at any point in time um, as compared to only a few hundred megawatts required to, to keep the system in balance so one one thing with the ancillary services market is that like it's what we call global so as long as everything's interconnected and there's no islanding of a particular state um, you'll find that um, you know, only a few hundred megawatts is required to keep the whole of the east coast of Australia in balance. So mm -hmm. the volume of energy is much more significant. Um, and that's the one thing is you can buy contracts, like I mentioned with cap contracts. You could sell cap contracts against a battery, for example. You could buy and, and sell energy. Um, but the, the key thing is with the arbitrage is to, you know, the spot price might be um, $50 overnight or nowadays we see it might go to minus 1,000. So you're actually getting paid to charge your battery. And then at 3 o'clock on a summer's day, it might be ten or $15,000, and you discharge the battery then. Um, mm. The key thing is that like, even with the negative prices, the money to be made is in the high prices because we've got, you'd only need, well, we're now at five-minute prices, but assuming as it was half hour in the, in the past, you know, you'd only need one half hour at, at $15,000. We'd still need seven and a half hours at minus 1,000, which doesn't happen or hasn't happened yet. Um, to, so you can see why you'd be more interested in, in, in coping with the high price spikes. Mm -hmm. The nature of it, like, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of value in a short period of time and less so for the rest of the time. And hence, this is still why at this point in time, um, you know, the, the shorter duration uh, is more attractive. Um, okay. So I saw um, recently, and there's been a lot in the news about solar, um, rooftop solar as well in Australia. So we've 
we're just coming towards the end of spring. So we've got a lot of solar energy. And I think South Australia broke the world record for the first yes. gig gigawatt scale grid to run 100% of solar for I, I don't know how long it was. So we've been seeing like every single day, we've been seeing negative prices during the middle of the day when, um, you know, everyone's solar panels are making making a lot of electricity. Um, and then obviously they go positive in the evening. And so I kind of assumed that those sort of market conditions would lead to people, you know, wanting to, to take advantage of arbitrage. But that's not something we, we use a lot in Australia now, right? Um, I was just wondering if you think um, there's something blocking it or if you think it will come as this, you know, persists year after year? Um, well, so uh, it's, a, it's an important change. Uh, it's actually reasonably relevant to, um, you know, uh, I guess the two and four hour storage um, starting to become more attractive because, um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the high power batteries uh, make their money from the high price spikes. So if we get more storage come in, uh, say like more, you know, two hour batteries, we would obviously expect to see that they're all trying to compete for a short duration spike, you know, maybe it's three or six o'clock in the afternoon now. Um, and that starts to be eroded, but the price sits at a you know uh, minus five hundred or below zero for a significant period of time. Then there's not such an advantage to having the high um, power, um, uh, you know, short duration. Um, but you know, I guess we need to see this sort of flow through for a while, or, or some of these batteries to be subsidised to make these longer duration um, battery investments. Uh, you know, and, and we do see that there's sort of mechanisms like in New South Wales, but um, for renewable energy zones, and they are actually looking at pump storage. But you know, it is obviously a, a form of energy storage as well. I mean, I, I guess when just covering off on your chart, I mean, I, I do think that some of these are probably, um, it's a bit of double counting for some of these, depending upon uh, in the way that obviously arbitrage can be you know, for many of these categories, um, for excess wind and solar. I mean, if you're, um, if you're connected to the grid, I mean, um, and, and depending on your transmission constraints, of course, that normally you'll just, you'll run a battery for arbitrage, regardless of what the wind or solar farm is doing. And that won't change the way that you'll run a battery, except if it's uh, constrained. And, and normally, if you have a constrained connection point, the, the, the economics of storage are not yet really, well, still a long way off to justify putting a battery in for a constrained connection point. It's still going to be better to upgrade the connection point. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask a question that I got um, from um, one of the Patreons, uh, Chris. He says, uh, electricity grids today anywhere near fully realising the potential of grid-scale batteries? What would be the benefits of a full move to day-cycle grid-scale batteries? Um, yeah, and he suggests some benefits, like would we see stable prices, steady output even for renewables, removing dirty peaker plants? Do well, I don't think, think we'll ever, we won't see stable prices because that would if we had stable prices, then there'd be no um, justification for investing in batteries. There's got to be, uh, you know, it's sort of, um, there's a bit of a cliche in energy markets, you know, that the cure for high prices is high prices. So, like, yeah. you see high prices, people start putting batteries in, and then, you know, um, the price depresses, but only to a point such that, like, um, you know, if everyone starts going out of business, then they'll start withdrawing those investments Um so I, I don't think we're ever going to get like, you know, it's not going to be perhaps on your definition of stable. The nature of the way that this market works is that the volatility is there. It needs to be there to, you know, get people to build generation, uh, invest in batteries. Um, and, and particularly, I guess, with the ancillary services market, that it really is just another far more volatile form of the spot market that is worth, you know, basically little or nothing much of the time. And then like an event happens uh, and it's worth a lot of money. And the, the key thing with all of these that everyone wants to contract at the end of the day that um, you've got an expensive investment, be it a generator or a battery. Um, no one really relies upon spot markets uh, you know, and only spot markets. They'll try and contract um, because then they can increase their level of debt if they've got better revenue certainty. And as soon as you get higher debt, you get a better return, you get a better loan from the bank. Uh, and you can go and build more projects and be more profitable. Okay. 
it always comes down to economics. Like, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm really focused on the technologies, but there's almost no question I can ask about anything in the energy transition that does, doesn't come down to economics in the end. Um, okay, I wanted to move on to, a lot of people have questions about specific technologies. Um, and so this is an example of one uh, from Alan Hall, is the form energy battery solution, iron oxide, a multi-day storage solution. And I think... Um, yeah, there's there's a I don't really know much about iron oxide to be honest. I can't comment on that question. Sorry. Okay. Um, but then in general, people are asking. Like I had a I'm question well, from I can Robert. answer that. So about just, multi -day yeah, I, I don't, people just want to know about multi day storage and um, you know, like what what new technologies are coming on that are going to fill that, or or is it just not going to because of the economics? Um, how do you how do you see us moving beyond you know we've got this like lithium ion batteries or other you know other kinds of chemistries are probably pretty easily going to be able to fill in the the duck curve from you know like lots of solar in the middle of the day and then a de demand peak in the evening that seems like a pretty easy problem to solve um but going a bit longer you know like 10 hours plus is a bit harder and then um seasonal storage do you see new technologies coming on that are going to be able to fill those gaps or is this a problem that still remains to be solved? Uh, it's probably in the latter camp mostly at the moment, I, I feel. I mean, um, I guess going back to um, uh, multi-day storage, it's sort of like no one would bother doing it at the moment because they'll make no money out of it. So mm -hmm. until that changes, people aren't likely to, to do that. Um, I mean, if, for example, uh, off the top of my head, if you had a, uh, if a battery was, say, $500 a kilowatt hour and you used it for 10 years and ignoring losses and degradation, that means if you used it every day, I think you need probably about $150 a kilowatt hour every single day reliably. So, you know, the, the point is that, um, in reality, what happens if a grid scale battery earns that? It's more likely to do it by earning very little much of the time and then it earn, as I said, $15,000 um, um, per megawatt hour. And that will average, help you get the average over the year. Um, it's very difficult to sort of, you know, for someone to discharge a battery over a number of days to wait months and months uh, for them, for this opportunity. It's sort of, the nature of the spot market doesn't really, um, I guess a better way of putting it is that, yes, this uh, is obviously a problem that we can, you know, uh, those in the industry can see, uh, and it is coming. Um, the market's not pricing at the moment. Uh, well, you know, when we talk about contracting, the window's only normally out three, maybe five years at best. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you, you can't get the contracting certainty. So, like, you know, you might be convinced of your technology, but, like, you're gonna to have to put your own money up for that. Um, and you know, at the moment, um, the returns aren't there. So that's why not much is happening unless people start to subsidize it. Yeah, but I think I saw of... one, maybe it was a flow battery, it might've been ESS, I could be totally wrong about that, but someone's parted off, partnered up with um, Munich Re, a reinsurance company to, um, you know, it's a new technology and then they've partnered up so they can offer insurance over the next 10 years because I think, I mean, I know I've worked with the, the wind industry and every time you develop a new um, technology, you have to spend a lot of effort convincing the banks that it's a good technology if it's going to last uh, long enough that the business case makes sense. And um, so I think that's kind of a, an interesting way to go that they've added this insurance product onto their new technology so that people um, can feel feel confident to invest in something. Yeah, I mean, it, um uh, there's a lot of, I guess not everyone would be aware, but the, you know, there's a reasonable amount of activity in, in, in weather derivatives. You mentioned that previously that, um, uh, you know, you could buy insurance to make sure that, um, uh, I guess what we'd call a wind run, the number, the average, you know, wind speed over a, a year, if it meets or if it doesn't meet some threshold, you get an insurance payout for a less windy uh, year. I mean, that's one way of, you know, minimizing the risk to a wind farm. Obviously, in a physical sense, it doesn't do anything for the market because an insurance product doesn't suddenly provide the electricity that the market needs. Mm. Um, I think that the challenge at the moment is, you know, the spot market is really based upon, you know, it, it's delivering energy when it's needed right now uh, on a given half hour, a day or whatever. Um, it doesn't really, um, 
address um, sort of the, I guess, the medium term issues of like, shall we say, a wind or a solar drought um, for an extended period of time. Um, and, and that's what's going to need to be addressed. Um, uh, I think that we don't really know the answer at the moment, but obviously mm. there's a lot of people working on it. Yeah, it does sound like for these longer durations and especially seasonal, like I can't really see a way out of, um, you know, governments having to intervene to, sure. you know, m make sure the capacity is there. I can't really see the business case on its own when you just, yeah, like charge something once and then leave oh. it for a year. Yeah. I mean, just to, to be you know, economically blunt about it, I guess the question would be that, like, you know, uh, if you can go and invest in a lithium ion battery and it's cheaper per kilowatt hour than any other technology, and then, like, well, someone says to you, well, um, uh, you know, can you invest in a, you know, an eight-hour battery, for example, and the, it's going to cost per, more per kilowatt hour, um, you know, and I mentioned you, you need $150 per kilowatt hour per day over 10 years. Um, mm. But, like, if you look at the average you get over, like, um, uh, so say a day you're looking at thousands, uh, over a year we need hundreds, if you averaged over a week or a month or some period of like um, you know, time, you know the you're only going to be probably getting tens of dollars per megawatt hour. So the question is, can you say, well, I can buy lithium for five hundred dollars a kilowatt hour, it gives me two hours of storage. You want me to invest in an eight-hour solution that's going to probably cost more per kilowatt hour, mm -hmm. on the understanding that it will last longer, but in time it will come good. And like, well, why would I invest in a technology that um, the market doesn't value it right now and it costs more so that's you know really why um you know it's not happening as at the moment but, yeah you know, and i i think it's hard to predict the future as well because oh, like sure. I, I personally think that we don't really know how much seasonal storage we're going to need um i've got a comment here from john norris what's the feasibility of building up wind energy sources in the u.s mid midwest um, where they've got a lot of steady wind and transporting the power to the east-west coast. And, I mean, you could just make that comment about um, uh, about interconnection in general. I think that that's, you know, one way that we'll probably see some smoothing of the, you know, seasonal variations and then maybe some other technologies like in, the, in Europe's north they have um, a lot of, you know, heating demand in the winter and there's not as much renewables, but already some districts you know, for a long time have been storing heat over the, the summer um, from com combined heat and power or, you know, from solar now. I, and then they use it in the in the wintertime. I think, like, we don't know yet how all of those, all of those kind of other non-battery technologies are, are going to come in. So it would be really hard uh, to say, oh, I'm going to invest, like, I, I think we're going to need so much seasonal storage in 10 years' time, so I'm going to, you know, build out some huge hydrogen project or, you know, whatever else. It, it would be hard to know that you're going to make anything back from it because it's right. just... Well, I mean, I guess if we, you know, if we, um, you mentioned about Snowy, obviously Snowy 2.0 is happening. And that's a federal government intervention, basically. Uh, they've decided they want that to proceed. You know, it's not mm -hmm. a typical commercial decision. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's um, it's not uh, it's difficult to make in, in investments for generation for, for you know uh, I guess multi decades um, given the vagaries of, of the market and I guess the question almost comes back to you know how we want more renewables and we want less coal and, and less fossil fuels in the system um, you know we can resolve that a number of ways one was as was mentioned more transmission. Uh, the other is storage, and the other is to have more spill that you have. This is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if renewable energy is, you know, very cheap, um, just build more of it, waste some energy that, like, you know, uh, just goes to waste, but it's still, you know, it's not polluting. Um, and even it just means that the effective cost is a bit higher per megawatt hour for energy. Um, that, that might not necessarily work in all circumstances, but, you know, as a suite of options, um, you know, that needs to be considered as well. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people have pointed out to me that that's not actually so different to, you know, like you build a, a coal power plant or, or we used to build coal power plants and now we build gas ones, not for the, you don't expect them to run non, non-stop. You build them with a lot of surplus capacity and, you know, electricity lines as well are built with surplus capacity. They're designed for the peak, not for the the average or the base load. And it's kind of, it's just basically the same with, you um, wind and solar except for that the fuel is free so you know it, it's not such a maybe it doesn't really matter 
either that you're you're wasting some of that um, energy. Well, then that drives much of the cost, you know, whether it's uh, the energy bill uh, or the, the the network costs. In the same way that we you know we see a spike of fifteen thousand dollars, which is meant to be enough to get the um, the peaking generators to run for those short durations each year. Uh, in the same way that you know, your network charge is, is built um, to maintain um, power of that forty five degree day. Uh, mm. not what you're not using normally. So it's mm. covering those heavy fixed costs that need to be accounted for. That's part of the challenge. Yeah. And the other thing that people um, say to me about, um, yeah, like cur curtailing is apparently, you know, anybody who has who's organised an off-grid system for themselves has done that calculation between, you know, how much solar, how much diesel um, and batteries and, I think everybody is over designing their solar and wind if they've got it because that that's the cheapest thing overall. Um, so I did I've got another comment from a viewer just Dave. If off grid people with their own battery storage, will the power countries push the government to tax those people to make up the loss of revenue because they're on the grid? I guess I just wanted to talk about um, to what extent do you think that it makes sense to have this um, battery storage, you know, behind the meter or maybe, you know, is it better to have it at the wind turbine or community batteries, um, you know, like locally to save el electrons from having to travel too far? Do you see big differences in where the batteries are located? Um, well, I guess um, certainly um, I've done work previously um, for uh, for some of the governments, it's household storage um, without a subsidy or a um, uh, like a, um, a demand response or a participation in ancillary service markets is difficult to, to you know for the household to stack up. Certainly at this time, um, community batteries are obviously um, a growing opportunity. I've done some work on that previously. It does. Um, um, and one of the motivations is obviously network businesses. If people are consuming less power, um, it's a way to grow their their business um, outside of the traditional poles and wires. So they're certainly motivated to do that. Um, I think there's a lot of um, potential value of, of community batteries in the sense that they can provide uh, you know various services to the market at a distribution level. Um, and of course, I mean, look at the end of the day, I think there's a place for you know. Uh, behind the meter, you know, household batteries. Um, I don't think we really need to subsidise them. Um, community batteries make sense in some locations um, and, and also grid batteries. It, you know, it's, I know people tend to talk about the uh, the value stack, but my experience would be that, like, you know, uh, the the sum is greater than the value of the parts. That, like, uh, there's a lot of, when you're competing between various, you um, uh, uh, revenue streams that like there's a there's a compromise between what you can earn and certainly when I looked at you know community battery in, in the past it's sort of like one of the great efficiencies of it is that you if you look at the diversity of households and if you're I don't know each household wanted 10 kilowatt hours of storage um, you could provide you know um, you could probably sell from a community battery 50 percent more capacity than you physically have and, and always be able to meet that and that's because of the diversity of household load, that the day that your household has the most battery energy stored is probably a hot day um, when you're not at home, you're not consuming anything, and then you consequently don't consume it when you get home in the evening. So mm -hmm. when you look over a portfolio of households, you know, in a given distribution area, um, so, the, you know, I, I'd say the argument you could be more efficient in terms of the battery being utilised uh, much more effectively at that level. The funny thing is, though, that when the, the network's not constrained, you could sort of, you could arbitrarily sell as much storage as you want because it really just ends up being a financial product because um, you could sell a virtual battery. Well, if it's a virtual battery, you could sell them any size you want. Um, and, you know, as long as the network's not too constrained most of the time, um, that's not really a problem. But uh, look, anyway, probably getting off track there, but I think there's, um, it makes sense in each of those opportunities. Um, um, I think batteries are going to uh, make a more significant part of, you know, the electricity, uh, the electricity system in future for sure. Okay. Uh, we're running out of time and um, there's a yeah. few 
a few topics that I didn't get to, but I'll just say a lot of the questions about specific battery technologies, I'm going to try and organize um, project tours, um, make, you know, normal um, pre-recorded videos on them. So keep the suggestions coming of the ones that you are most interested in so I can prioritize. And then I think I'll do uh, another later on, I'll do another one on another live stream on long duration storage because I think that there's, um, yeah, a whole different set of issues there. And I think it's got a lot to do probably with government policy and uh, economics as well. So maybe I'll get a different expert in. But I did just want to ask you, Warwick, if you could just sum up with what do you think um, the the biggest thing that needs to happen to, you know, really get batteries rolling out their full potential as soon as possible? What are the the key next, um, you know, obstacles that we have to clear to get that happening quickly? If you could just choose uh, I one think thing. the biggest one, the first one is always price. So that, you know, the economics are important. So um, and we're seeing, you know, rapid um, decline in price for lithium ion. Uh, hopefully that will continue and expect, is expected to. Um, there are environmental concerns, obviously, about lithium and some of its recycling. So I guess I think that um, um, some of the flow technologies will, will hopefully uh, become you know, more cost competitive in time by building bigger systems and more volume. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, um, you know, again, it comes down to price. Um, I don't think we need to legislate for home batteries, for example. I think that that should be, you know, a personal consumer choice if people want to go down that path. Um, but yeah, and obviously enabling the, uh, you know, regulatory changes such as five-minute settlement that came in to make batteries um, uh, take advantage of their competitive strength, uh, which we've seen in the Australian context. Um, yeah, I think that's it for the moment, sure. Okay. Well, yeah, thanks so much for coming in and sharing your expertise with us. Um, I also yes. need to thank again the sponsor of this live stream, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. Um, and I want you to check out our latest Uptime podcast episode in the link at the description because I do a, a weekly podcast with the guys from WeatherGuard um, on the latest episode we talked about um, Bill Gates has got a new nuclear power project in the US, a really big one. Um, is this a safe diversification of the power production? And there was also a 13 meter thermoplastic wind turbine blade um, 3D printed recently. So that's an interesting step um, towards, you know, recyclable wind turbine blades potentially. Um, also Siemens Gamesa started a pilot project that's producing green hydrogen directly from wind. So check out that in your favorite podcast app or you can watch it here on YouTube and I've put uh, links in the description to the video. Also, as always, a really big thank you to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team for their support. So if you want to join the team and support the channel's growth, um, help steer the future direction and join chat on the Patreon-only Discord server, then um, you can find the Patreon link in the description. Um, the next live stream is going to be on December 14th, and it's going to be on wind turbine blade aerodynamics. Um, I have another great guest for that one who's an expert in blade add-ons like Vortex generators. So I'm going to cover all the, I get a lot of questions about this topic, like about, you know, if you can put winglets on wind turbine blades. And um, I also, for some reason, get asked a lot about tubercles, which are like the bumps on um, humpback whale fins <laughs> and whether they can be applied to wind turbines. So yeah, that's it for today. And again, huge thanks to, to Warwick for spending your time with us today to explain all the intricacies of the, yeah, the energy market and how batteries fit in. It's just so, so complicated, you know, like you think that it's a, a you know, a, a technology problem and then spend most of our time talking about, yeah, markets and um, all that sort of thing. So I can appreciate the breadth, the breadth and depth of knowledge that you've got. So thanks a lot. Thank you. I'll see you all next time. Bye.